It was January 1st, 2005. I was 55 years old, happily married with a young son. I was the owner of Video D Studios, a successful company producing videos for internationally known artists and choreographers. I didn't know it at the time, but that New Year's Day, my life would be changed forever. I was leaving my mom's house and driving back to New York City where I lived and my son, who was four years old, was in the back seat and all of a sudden an explosion went off in my head. There were no lights, but the noise just kept popping, 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 popping and then pow! I pulled the car to the side of the road and I thought maybe I blew a tire. When I got back in the car, I asked my son if he was okay. He was. I wasn't. Was that the sort of initial awakening that maybe you needed some professional help? After the explosion in my head, the next thing that happened was I went home and I was just sitting in a daze. And it was that point that I went to look for medical help. Since then, I've looked back on my life and could see different things where I was bipolar, and meaning that I would come up with an idea and just go for it. In fact, I think my groundbreaking company, Video D Studios, was probably based on a manic episode that I had when I was 30 years old. How bipolar manifested in Dennis's life, especially before he was diagnosed and started treatment. Sometimes it was absolutely joyful and the generosity was through the roof and I'll take you shopping for clothes and let's go out for some crazy dinner and over the top things that were really kind and generous, which then made me not always see when the over the top was more frenetic. And then when he was down, I wouldn't quite understand it. I would just think he was working really hard. Nobody got happier than Dennis when he was happy, and nobody went lower than Dennis when he wasn't happy. There had always been discussions over the years of what's going on with Dennis. I remember his first wife would say, I think he's hypoglycemic. But once this diagnosis was heard and stuck. It helped to understand what he was going through. When we first learned that Dennis had bipolar disorder, after sort of going, well, at least we have an answer and then let's move forward and we were all this united front, comes the reality of still dealing with it because it doesn't go away. I didn't look back in my life to categorize bipolar's ups or downs for at least five or six years. I was just focused on the moment. When I was up, I would go into my office, I would try to get as much done because I felt the down was coming. It was like knowing that you were gonna hit a wall. Once I was down, I could stay in bed for 12 or 13 hours a day. Before he was diagnosed, Dennis was really successful. He was very productive. But the day he was diagnosed, he went into a tailspin. It's kind of like somebody said, hey kid, you're bipolar, you're done. But Dennis was not done, not by a long shot. And the cool part about all this is that I think that was all because of something his mom did for him when he was three years old. Well, you, we had a TV, and you would watch them dance on TV. And you said to me, how do they know how to dance? And I said, they go to dancing school. And you said, why don't I go? I said, you're too young. So finally, by the time you were three and a half, I said, OK, let's try it. We'll put him in dancing school, he'll never stay, and that'll be the end of it. Well, it wasn't the end of it, because it's still not the end of it. And at the age of 71, I can point my life back to that experience. 
tap dancing, I had a girl as a partner, and other kids' girls were like, ugh. And I was like, this is my partner. I'm dancing. I don't care. That's who I was. When I meet people, I tell them my name is Dennis Seymour Diamond, and within the first two sentences or three sentences, I tell them I'm bipolar. There was no crime. There was no shame. It happened. And many times they look at me and say, oh, you're functional. And I go, functional? I went to the High School of Performing Arts as a ballet dancer and a modern dancer. I was a Broadway dancer. I started a video company that started a whole field of archival recording, putting a camera in the back of the theater. I also bought the building that I lived in. In addition, when I left that career and moved to Atlanta, I taught myself to draw, I taught myself to sculpt, and my work is represented in a major New York City gallery. I remember when Dennis told everybody he's moving to Atlanta, and people go, why is he moving to Atlanta? He's a lifelong New Yorker. He was never going to leave. Dennis's life changed when he was diagnosed. I don't think he was going to Atlanta. I think he was leaving New York. You know that song, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere? Dennis could no longer make it. I always thought I'd stay in New York. Bipolar was affecting me so badly, I couldn't run my business. When I said I would move to Atlanta, there was a huge cry from my wife and my son saying, are you crazy? And I said, no, I'm bipolar. I wrote a book called Bipolar Within, Who Am I? I wrote it by myself. I had nobody edit it. And if you read it, you'll see all the mistakes. How did I make the book? You couldn't stop me. I had something I needed to do, and I had to do it for myself. I just started writing. I came up with a topic, and I'd write it. And then I'd leave it. And then I'd come up with another topic. And I'd write it and leave it. And on and on and on. That's the bipolar, and I'm out there about it. I don't sell the book. I give it away. It might save somebody's life. So you want people to understand you. You want them to understand your experience. And maybe, you know, that is a way of people understanding what it's like. A number of people I talk to know somebody who's bipolar and are fascinated to hear my story my experiences. When I say to somebody that I'm bipolar, I'm opening myself up as wide as possible for anything. And when the people respond, it's like the most intimate thing they could tell me. I don't laugh at them. I don't judge them. We compare experiences, hopefully to learn what it's about with somebody else. Does that help you? When I hear somebody else's story about them being bipolar or having a mental imbalance, that means they've dealt with it slightly, they're willing to talk about it, and I learn from them. It's almost like two people from the same religion getting together, they know shorthand. Yes. And so in bipolar, getting together, we have shorthand. Because people who don't have bipolar can't really understand what it's like on the inside. That's correct. That's what I tried to say in the book. That's mm -hmm. what I, I want people to know what it's like inside, not what I've done. This is who I am. I had an uncle Icky, and he used to say, this is my donkey. And if you don't like my donkey, you can kiss my ass. And so, <laughs> it's about me. I mean, this is who I am. If you don't like it, that's your problem. I read Dennis's first book. I didn't know any of the feelings that he uh, uh, wrote down on the book. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I never noticed that. It was sort of a very interesting moment of illumination for me. And it was very articulate about the cacophony of input 
that he deals with. One of the pluses of being bipolar is that when I'm manic, I get to ride that wave of creativity. One day I was suddenly compelled to draw a glass of water with bubbles in it. My friend Jonathan, who's an artist, said to me, wow, those bubbles are moving. They're dancing. All that stuff comes from your professional dance movement. And so Jonathan would then give me new challenges, new challenges, new challenges. And of course, every time he gave me a new challenge, I go, leave me alone, forget it. I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. And I think about it and then I go try it. I was walking in the park and I saw these trees and I thought, wow, that's interesting. Maybe I could sort of draw them because when I had a video company, I would draw schematics and my friend would always say, oh my gosh, these are art pieces. And I would tell him, no, they're not. They're schematics and I'm doing something else. I didn't try to do faces. I didn't try to do animals. I didn't try to do anything else. Trees, I would sit out in the park and look at trees. And in Bipolar Within, there are a lot of trees and each tree is different. Hands. I was in a restaurant and the waitress put her hand right here, tapping me. And I looked. I went, wow, that's an interesting configuration. Hands. So I started drawing hands. I always need to be doing something, so I take my drawings with me everywhere. Sitting in the lounge, sitting at the restaurant, wherever I am, I have a book with me that I'm drawing. So you have an outlet for that energy, should you feel a need to expel it. The energy is always there, except when I'm down from the bipolar. Drawing is very calm. It's very focused. I'm not listening to anybody else. Right. So you're talking a little bit about sort of what keeps you regulated, that the drawing is something that helps you regulate this energy and your creativity. Are you surprised that I'm drawing? Very surprised, because I can't draw with a, a straight line with a ruler. And nobody in our family was able to draw. But you, whenever you decided to do something, you became the best at it. You didn't have to go to a school to learn it. You'd just draw and become absolutely the best. It's just fantastic. I don't know how you do it. Neither do I. I always say it's a gift. It is a gift. My artist friend Jonathan said to me, how about working with copper? Go down to this place and talk to them. I met this guy named Dallas Vincent. He said, I'd like to work with copper. How do you do that? He said, well, you need to buy some copper and then you need to buy this coping saw. It looks like, sort of like this. He took a piece of copper, put it down. He went a circle. And I looked at him and it said, you show off. Go stick it. <laughs> we both laughed and he's been my friend for years and he keeps showing me new things to do. Since I was diagnosed bipolar, I've learned to write and I've published 10 books. I learned to draw and I've learned to sculpt, to create things out of copper. It's fantastic to go from thinking my life was over to discovering all these hidden talents inside myself. But nothing has been more gratifying than working with mobiles. Mobiles are a whole different experience. Mobiles have this special movement to it and always moves. And you never know based on the light or the day or the design how it would be. I have no idea how I came up with the concept of the angel. I just was drawing stuff and there it was and I cut it out and it became a signature piece. I've probably made 700 angels and probably 1,200 copper pieces. And I give them away to children with their name on it. When I've seen these children again, they say to me, oh, it's hanging in my bedroom. Oh, it's hanging outside on the back porch. Oh, it's hanging over my favorite toys, which makes me thrilled because a book you might read once or twice. 
but the mobile is constantly moving and gives you a different perspective. I guess about six years divorced, um, we actually have a better relationship than we did before. And I'm, I'm, I talk to him constantly and we have dinner once a week and we talk about Alexander all the time and we end up in New York at the same time with family friends. So our lives are still pretty intertwined. He's in a really steady space and has been so in the last couple of years. And I do think that the quietness that his art, it, that he can just focus like that, I think it's made a difference. On the one hand, you're saying, this is just who I am. You know, if you don't like it, go f yourself. On the other hand, you're saying, this is who I am, but I've really learned how to manage a lot of things so that I don't alienate people in my life, so that I don't damage relationships. Throughout this roller coaster, I have learned about myself in great detail. I've learned how bipolar can affect other people. Many times I can look at someone and can tell that they are bipolar after they start talking to me because of the glaze in their eye, mm. the physical thing. So yes, I've learned a lot. I never say to anybody, I'm bipolar and I don't know how to control it, never. I say I'm bipolar, this is who I am. And they have to understand that I've been dealing with it. When I look at the transformation that Dennis has made over the years, I think it's nothing short of a miracle. His books, his drawings, his sculpture, they made a difference in not just Dennis's life, but so many other people. And along the way, while Dennis is helping everybody else, he was doing so much to help himself. I remember this one time I'm watching Dennis craft a piece of art out of a sheet of copper. And I'm thinking, wow, this is so cool. I'm, I'm actually looking at a work in progress. And then it dawned on me. I was actually looking at two works in progress, the art, and the artist. <laughs>